Fear is something I deal with on a regular basis. I'm sure you do too. So this message is for me as much as anyone else. Now about fear. Fear is a natural instinct that God places in us to preserve life. If I'm on a walk with my dog and I see a mountain lion up ahead, which hopefully you wouldn't see around here, but if I did, I'd probably turn around and, and head the other way, right? That's, that's a fear instinct that rises up within our, we humans, and it's biological, and it's designed for our protection. But then there's this other type of fear. It's not that preservation kind of fear that is natural, but it's a type of spiritual fear. And for some, it can be debilitating, or even worse, cause us to walk away from the blessings of living a called out, a sold out, victorious life in God's kingdom. Now, we all face fearful situations and circumstances in our lives. I remember graduating from high school. Seven days later, I pushed off to the U.S. Army. And that was a traumatic event in my life. I was not even 18 yet. I was 17. I would turn 18 that July. It was in June when I left. Had never really left home before in my life. I was going to a completely different environment around people from all over the world, different uh, you know, a lot of diversity in the Army. There were people from California. There were people from the South. There were people from the East. Uh, there were Asian people, Hispanic people. I, I'd never been around that kind of diversity before. And I remember at 24 getting married to my wife. There was fear there. Even though I knew I loved her and I knew that this was what I wanted to do, I think every guy experiences that fear like, this is it. I'm, I'm tied down at this point. Um, you know, there's various transitions from one job to another in my life, and I've been very fortunate that I haven't had too many of those job transitions. I, I went through last night, and I counted the various times that I had to leave one job and go to another, and it was only four times, and I've been working since 18. Uh, so only four times that I had to leave one job and go to another. So God's blessed me there. But with each one of those transitions, there was fear. There was fear that I make the right choice. So should I have stayed at the last job? You know, you, you let fear overtake you. And more recently, just going through now two church transitions in the last four years. You know, the first one we did when we lost uh, Brother Kelly, it took us four months to replace him with Brother Carroll. And then when, when we last lost Brother Carroll, it's taken us ten months to replace him. And there's been a lot of fear, and I've tried not to show that, but I'm going to be transparent with you that I've experienced a lot of fear through that process. You know, is God going to answer? Are we going to get a good man of God? Is, is God going to take care of us? And I knew he would, but you still have that fear. And, I, and I'm sure, you know, Brother Waddell has the same fears going on in him. You know, he's, he's uh, moving here to become a pastor of people. And being a pastor of people is tough. One day, people can be singing Hosanna to you, and then before the week's out, they're saying, crucify him. So there's a lot of fear, I'm sure, that he's experienced. You know, he's leaving a comfortable position in his church as an uh, associate pastor and a comfortable job and a comfortable home. And uh, I was looking at some pictures he was showing me on his phone and of his grandkids and, and the house he was in looked really nice. And I said, is that your home? And he goes, oh, yeah, that's our home. Well, yeah, I think he said they built it a f few years ago. And um, I thought, wow, he's, he's going to leave that and come here and move into that. You know, so, so he's making a lot of change. They're making a lot of changes in their life. And, and I have to believe that he feels a burden for this area, for this church. And I'm thankful for that. But that doesn't erase the fact that there might be some fears that he's going through. So at various times in life, fear will often talk to you and try to convince you not to take that next step. And some people miss out on the destiny that God has for them because they hear fear talking louder to them than what, God, what they hear God talking to them. And never make life-altering decisions that are fueled by fear. If fear is in the picture, then it's not of God. First Timothy 1 and 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
Now, I said all that to lead you up to the text for tonight's lesson. My text is going to come out of uh, Isaiah chapter 43. And no, we're not going to read the entire chapter, but we're going to focus on a few key verses that I hope will help us overcome the spiritual fear we can often experience in life. Now, allow me, to lo- allow me to lay some groundwork for this passage of Scripture that I'm about to expound on. Isaiah has been given the assignment to prophesy and preach to the nation of Judah. Now, Judah, as we all know, was part of the United Kingdom of Israel. But the kingdom was split in two after King Solomon died, and now we have the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. So Isaiah is a prophet to the nation of Judah. But the problem with Judah at this time is that they were living in great sin. They had strayed from God. They had disobeyed God. They dishonored God. They're not following his statutes. They're worshiping other gods. And and Isaiah has the assignment to tell them that God is going to judge them. So for the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, it's nothing but Isaiah prophesying judgment upon Judah. And when you are in a place in life where you are being told you're going to get a whipping, that's not a good place to be. The worst whipping I can remember in my life was when I was around 10 or 11 years old. Me and some neighbor friends uh, strolled down the road to a little trucking outfit that Seemed like they were only in operation half the time. They weren't there eight hours a day, and the place was vacant a lot. And we, we used to sneak inside there and run around. And, and one day we were outside the building, and they had these huge windows with all these little panes. And for some reason, it is a 10 or 11-year-old, it seemed like a good idea <laughs> to pick up rocks and just bash all those windows out. And that's what we did. For the next half hour, 40 minutes, me and my neighbor buddies – just took rocks and aimed at those little windows until they were all busted out. Now, sure enough, we were doing this in broad daylight. Somebody called the house who witnessed it, told my mother. She was very upset, and she let me know that Dad would deal with me when he got home. It was early in the, I mean, it was 1 or 2 o'clock, and Dad probably wasn't going to be home till dark, so I had all day to think about it. And that made it worse just thinking about the whipping that I was going to get. I almost wished I would have just, if mom would have just took care of it there on the spot and it had been over with. But no, she made me wait until dad got home. And dad, dad rightfully gave me a good old whipping. And I, I remember that. That's probably the worst whipping I ever got. We don't really do that anymore, do we? <laughs> but this is where Judah is at the moment. Isaiah has told them of the coming judgment, and they are left to deal with the punishment that lies ahead for them. Are you with me? Am I, are you following? This is where Judah is. There, there are whippings on the way, and they've been told by Isaiah. So when you get to chapter 40 of Isaiah, a transition or a shift occurs in the message Isaiah is preaching to them. In chapter 40, Isaiah begins to shift his message to saying that even though God is going to punish you, Even though you have this whipping coming, you're going to go through this whipping, this punishment, and I'm going to bring you out of this whipping, and you will come out of it better than what you were before. Now, you should get excited about that. This is how our guard works. Yes, we make mistakes. We get off track. We fall into sin. We we serve a God, but we serve a God who's righteous. He will punish us for our sins. I mean, that's what a righteous God does. He punishes you for your sins. And that's what good parents do. They punish you for your wrongdoings. But we will come out of it better than the way we came into it. I would like to think that those whippings I got made me a better kid as time went on. So this is the background to bring you up to chapter 43, which is my text for tonight. First 39 chapters in Isaiah, judgment. Chapter 40, a shift occurs in the message. By chapter 43... The the first verse starts off with two very profound words, but now. But now. These two words, but now, are for somebody here tonight who's had drama, pain, frustration, and all kinds of stuff going on in your life. God is sticking his but now in your life, and a shift is about to occur in your circumstances. Now, I don't know who I'm talking to. Perhaps I'm talking to myself. 
But we've all had bad choices we've made. We've all fallen away from God. We've neglected the things we know we should be doing. And God is punishing us for these wrongs. And we've had to reap the consequences for our decisions. But God is bringing us up to a but now situation in our lives. I mean, are you hearing me right now? I want God to stick his but now into my situation. I need it. And I'm ready for a shift in my circumstances. Isaiah 43 and 1 says, But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy thy name, thou art mine. So there it is. He said, fear not. Fear not. Don't be ruled by fear. Don't let fear govern you. Some of you will never move forward, never start your business, never write that book, Never develop that talent you know God has given you. Never make that trip to the altar. Never invite that friend to church. Never conduct a Bible study with your neighbor. But the word says, fear not. Fear not. Fear not. I have learned this myself. I often allow my fear to keep me from attaining all that God has for me. And right here in verse 1 of Isaiah 43, the prophet lays out five reasons why we shouldn't be fearful. And all five reasons are in verse 1. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob. We need not fear because God created us. We are his creation. This word create in the Hebrew can mean choose. He chose you. He selected you. He picked you out. Some of us were in the muck, in the mire. Some of us were in the bar. Some of us were on drugs, caught up in addictions. And I don't know where you were, but he plucked us out of our circumstances. He chose us. And that's great news. I've been blessed to not have such a dramatic testimony as some. I, you know, I haven't been delivered from drugs. I was never into drugs. I was never into alcohol. I didn't run with gangs. And and I've heard some pretty amazing testimonies from people of what God has brought them out from. And I've had no such life, and I thank the Lord for that. But God still has delivered me. I've been raised in church since my mother started attending when, when I was two years old, I believe. And for as long as I can remember, I've been coming to church. I've either been drugged to church or I've come on my own to my own will. But that doesn't mean anything. I can't ride my mother's coattails to heaven. I have to know God for myself. And the sad truth is that many a people will slide into hell someday from a church pew. There are people sitting on the church pew that are just doing it out of habit. They don't really have that relationship with God. He selected us, church. He chose us. He created us to be part of a royal priesthood. We need not fear because we are God's creation. Repeat that. He created me. He created me. Here's the second reason. It says, he formed thee, O Israel. The word formed here means to be squeezed into shape. Some of us are in a period of our life where God is squeezing us. He's shaping and molding us into what he wants us to be. Some of the drama we are facing in our lives is God trying to squeeze some of the world out of us so we can fulfill the destiny he has for us. Stop crying about our situations. We need to stop whining about our circumstances. Just like the potter, God is bending over with the clay in his hand, and he's molding you into what he wants you to be. He's got you on his wheel. He's spinning, and he's wetting, and he's spinning, and he's molding you. He's applying pressure. He's spinning, and he's wetting, and he's spinning, and he's molding, shaping us into that vessel he wants us to be. And we need to learn to thank God for everything that that has happened in our lives. Those things happening now and those things that we yet have to face because that is God molding us into that finished product he wants us to be. He's forming you. And there are a lot of things in my life that I don't necessarily like. I, things that have happened to me over the years, I'd, I'd like to forget. If I could go back and erase some of those things, I would do that. Situations that I've been through, situ- situations I'm still in. But I have to realize that this is God forming me. And as I look back on my life and think about all I've been through, I can't deny that these things all played a part in making me the person that I am today. God is forming us. He's squeezing us. 
And I observe people who have had very traumatic things happen in their lives, sometimes one right after another. And I think, why, Lord? Why does that person have to go through these kind of things? And those are tough questions to answer. And I read an article on the Internet the other day, and it, and it talked about when a potter is forming his clay, making whatever it is that he's making. Sometimes there is so much resistance from the clay. It won't give. It won't yield. It's got knots in it that need worked out. It won't form the way the potter wants it to form. So he just has to stop the wheel, smash the clay, and start over again. Some of us have gone through these smashing moments in our lives, something super traumatic, a wake-up call. Some of us have had several wake-up calls, and every time he gets us just about where he wants us to be, something rises up inside, our pride, our arrogance, our independence, our, our rebellion. And when it gets like this, sometimes he just has to smash us and start all over again. God is interested in forming you. And don't be afraid. He's working on us. And I'm convinced that nothing can come into our lives without God's permission. The Bible teaches that the devil has to get permission to attack God's children. And we are the children of God. So if something unpleasant comes into my life, first, I know God okayed it. And if God okayed it, then I know he'll get me through it. And when I get through it, I know it will make me better than I was before it happened. So we need not fear when we trust in the Lord. He created me. He formed me. And wait, there's a third thing. Verse 1 continues, for I have redeemed thee. That word redeemed means that God bought us out of slavery. The devil took us. He abused us. He drug us through the mud. He beats us up, leaves us for dead. But God came along. He paid the price with his own blood and redeemed us. This is great news, church. Other than my mother, my wife, and my kids, not too many folks would pay me much mind outside of my loved ones. But God saw something in me. He saw something in you, something you didn't even see in yourself. He redeemed you. Number four, still in verse one, not only did God create us, not only did he form us, he redeemed us, but he says, I have called thee by thy name. That means he is revealing his desire for us to have an intimate relationship with him. He wants to be close to us. He knows us by name, church. We're not just a number to God. We're not just one among millions of people that have lived and died that served the Lord. He knows us by name. He knows everything about us. He knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows us by name. And until we know how much God truly loves us, until we come to understand how much God loves us, we're never going to have true peace in our life. We're never going to be able to get the victory that he has for us if we don't come to the understanding of how much God truly loves us. And I want to have a better revelation of just how much my creator loves me. As messed up as I am, as imperfect and sinful as I am, God still loves me. God knows me by name. Now, I'm coming to a close here. The fifth thing that verse 1 proclaims, verse 1 ends by saying, thou art mine. And that's good news, too. God says, you belong to me. I created you. I formed you. I redeemed you. I call you by your name, and I own you. You are my property. I don't know about you, but I take care of the things I own. I don't own much, but what I do own, I do my best to care for it. I preserve it. I sustain it, and I get upset when my kids bust it all up, and they do. I, I, when I see my kids treat something with disrespect, you know, they punch the wall or something. You want to get Rick upset. Start beating up something that's perfectly good and destroying it. I just don't, I don't stand for that. But that's me and my human nature. How much more does God care for the things he owns? And God says, I own you. Thou art mine. When the devil comes against you, remind him, I am God's property. I am my father's child. I am his son. I am his daughter. I am an heir of God. He paid a high price for me. I didn't come cheap. I was purchased by his own blood. He redeemed me. He paid for me. He formed me. Paid the ransom for me. Now I want to be done. I could easily end this lesson here on these five points. This passage gives us five reasons not to be afraid. He created me. He formed me. He redeemed me. He knows me by my name. 
and we are owned by him. Why should I fear? I shouldn't be afraid of anything in my life. I, I should be willing to obey him, take on, each, take on any trial that he throws my way. But if I begin to listen to the devil, he'll tell me all kinds of lies. But you have to remind yourself of these five things. God created me. He formed me. He redeemed me. He calls me by my name. I belong to him. I can take on anything. I can run through a troop. I can leap over walls. I will let nothing scare me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I will not be afraid. Fear not, the Bible says. So I'd like to stop there, but verse 2 is calling out to me. It's saying, tell them about me. So let me talk about verse 2. Isaiah 43 and 2 says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Notice how verse 2 starts off, When thou passest through the water. It didn't say if you pass through the waters. It said when you pass through the waters. The reality here is that every one of us here is going to have to go through some waters. At some juncture in our lives, we will have to pass through some waters. Now, anytime the Bible speaks of waters, it typically refers to a period of transition. In Genesis, when it talks about the waters covering the face of the deep, something is about to shift and change. When you read about the children of Israel leaving Egypt, God parted the Red Sea. The children of Israel passed through. Then Pharaoh's army tried to pass through but was drowned. It was a transition point for the Israelites. Later on, when Joshua and the children of Israel crossed the parted waters of the Jordan River and made it over to the Promised Land, this is a transition point for the Israelites. Jesus got baptized in the water, which began his public ministry. It was a transition point. You see this pattern a lot in the Bible, where anytime someone encounters waters, it represents a transition or a shift. And anytime you're going through the waters in your life, it represents a transition or a shift that's about to happen in your life. So how do we know when we're going through these waters? It's a great question, and I'm so thankful for this little tool in my eSword app that gives me the Hebrew and Greek meaning of a word. And this word waters in the second verse of chapter 43 is translated from the Hebrew word mayim which means dirty water, urine-filled water, waste water, filthy, smelly water. So here's how you know if you're going through the waters in life, when it's distasteful, something that you wouldn't have chosen for yourself, something you don't like, something smelly and filthy. Some of us are about to enter waters. Some of us are currently surrounded by waters. Some of us are coming out of waters. And if you find yourself in this situation, it means that you're in a place of transition. God is about to shift something in your life. The key is the scripture says when you go through waters, you're not going to the waters. You're going to go through them. But you need to tell yourself, I didn't come to stay here. I'm not going to camp out here at the waters. I'm not going to build a house here at the waters. I'm going through this thing. I'm going through the waters. But there's a great thing about the waters. Verse 2 says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. So we don't have to be afraid when we're going through the waters. God says he's with us at every stage. Isn't this great news? When I look back at the transition points in my life, I can thank God that he didn't abandon me. He didn't leave me. He stuck with me every step of the way. And when you pass through the waters, he is with you. But there's another type of water here. The scripture continues, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. So what are these rivers? The rivers represent cleaner waters. The rivers that flow and sustain life. Rivers in this scripture and many other passages of scripture typically represent a transition to prosperity. Prosperity, favor, blessings of God. It's through the rivers that life comes, that crops grow, that power can be derived from the rivers of water. Rivers of moving water. The scripture says, I'm going to bring you to places in your life where you're going to have rivers of water. You're going to have blessings. You're going to have favor. You're going to have prosperity. It's not always about passing through the waters. There's going to be rivers in our life where we're going to have God's blessings and favor and prosperity. But hold up. The scripture says, they shall not overflow thee. So let's talk about this. 
God's going to let us experience rivers in our life. But he said he won't let them overflow us. How many here know that not everybody can handle prosperity? Some folk let their prosperity go to their head. We experience prosperity in our lives, and before we know it, we begin to think we pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We begin to think we're the reason we are where we are in life. God's the reason we're where we are out in life, not us. God opened the doors. God made the way. God provided the resources. God knows just how much to let the blessings flow before he needs to turn it off so it won't overflow us. So we won't begin to think we are all that, think that we don't need God. I've noticed that God keeps me just poor enough to where I know I still need him. And I thank him for that. God knows that if I would get too much, I may stop coming to church. I may stop reading my Bible. I may stop crying out to him. So he gives us just enough that the rivers won't overflow us. That's how much God loves us. He knows what we can handle, both in the trials and in the blessings. Verse 2 ends by saying, When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. We are going to go through some painful, destructive moments in our lives. Fire that wants to come through, penetrate, and burn us. These fires in life, they're going to want to consume us, destroy us, reduce us to ashes. But the scripture says we shall not be burned. This reminds me of the story of the three Hebrew boys who were cast into the fiery furnace. They trusted in the God of Israel. They would not bow to the demands of the world. God delivered them from the fire. And we have that same promise here in this scripture. When God delivers us from the fires of this life, there will be no evidence that we even went through a fire. God is raising up a generation of believers who, when they go through the fires of life, they can say, hallelujah, anyhow. Never let life's troubles get you down. Have you ever heard the, the saying, when life's troubles come your way, lift your hands to God and say, hallelujah, anyhow. You'll come through the fire and not be burned. You'll come through the fire and not be scorched. And there won't even be the smell of smoke on you. Great is the God we serve and greatly to be praised. There is none like you, O Lord. Don't be afraid to walk through life. God is with you. Go through the waters, for I am with you. Go through the rivers. They shall not overflow thee. Go through the fires. They will not burn you. It says later on in that chapter, it says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Fear not, for I am with thee. So church, we don't have to fear tonight. I know there's a lot of things we fear about, and I have to tell myself this all the time because I'm a fret boy. I fret about everything. Kelly can tell you. And I just I need to learn to conquer that. We have no reason to fear. God gave us five good reasons why we shouldn't fear. Anyone want to recite those five? He created us. He formed us. He redeemed us. He knows us by name, and we are his. He owns us. And we can go through the waters. We can go through the rivers. We can go through the fires. God is with us. He's the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, our Savior. Fear not. So our announcements for tonight 